we can describe a psychopath or psychopathy as a, as a clinical construct uh, characterized by a cluster of uh, characteristics and features. And the cluster would include interpersonal characteristics, how we deal with other people, how the individual interacts with somebody else, affective characteristics, um, feelings, emotions, and uh, uh, other behaviors, including uh, socially deviant behaviors. Psychopaths are often described as callous, impulsive, manipulative, glib, egocentric, predatory, grandiose, and lacking empathy and emotional affect. Because psychopaths are high risk for breaking the law, many end up in jail. Of inmates serving sentences for violent crimes, about 20% score high on the psychopathy checklist. It is a disturbing fact, however, that the great majority of psychopaths are out in the real world undetected. They live on the narrow margins of the law, often engaging in cold-blooded and predatory behavior. These individuals cause incalculable damage to other people. But what's really going on in the mind of the psychopath? To answer this, Hare turned his attention to how the brain of a psychopath processes and uses information compared to the brains of individuals without the disorder. One measure of brain function involves the recording of brain EEG patterns while a person presses a key to indicate a distinction between non-words, neutral words, and emotional words. Psychopaths seem to process linguistic, semantic, and emotional material in a very superficial way, lacking affect. They do not relate to situations which, for most people, have emotional significance. Emotional connections seem to be lacking. In this test, Frisell's reaction time is the same for all three groups of words and non-words. Whereas most people would show an emotional reaction to words like cancer or death, compared to table or book, the psychopath reacts as if they were all the same, devoid of emotion. If the brains of psychopaths do function differently, does this mean that the structure of their brains is different? Bob Hare, Andra Smith, and their colleagues employed magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI. This technique allows researchers to study the brain in fine detail from many angles. So far, the results of this technique have not revealed any structural differences. One of the most convincing studies of the brains of psychopaths involves single photon emission computerized tomography, or SPECT. In this process, harmless amounts of radioactive tracers are injected into a subject's bloodstream. Activity in specific areas of the brain can then be observed. The white and red colors indicate the areas of highest mental activity. The green and blue colors indicate less activity. The normal individual, the non-psychopathic individual, shows widespread activation of the brain in performing this particular task, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it. The task is simple on the surface, uh, is that a word, push a button. But on the other hand, the brain processes involved are very complex. Many different parts of the brain have to be activated. And this is exactly what we find with the, the non-psychopathic individual in this task. And it's represented by widespread activation in the brain. Uh, indicating that uh, language areas are highly activated. You can certainly see them in the slides. And uh, some activity towards frontal part of the brain. In fact, there's a very nice anterior-posterior gradient where most of the activity is towards the frontal front part of the brain. Also some activity on the right side as well. Now, the, the, for, the, uh, for the emotional words, which are all negative in connotation, we see that there's uh, fairly uh, substantial activation in the right hemisphere as well, which is uh, not unusual. We know that the right hemisphere plays an important role in processing negative emotion, negative affect. If we look at the psychopaths, we get quite a different picture. And in fact, uh, the slides themselves are, are almost too dramatic. They, people would look at them and say, well, there's something wrong here. Are, are you really looking at somebody who's awake and alert and, and active? Well, in fact, these individuals were active. Uh, they, were, uh, they were performing the task as well as the non-psychopaths were performing, but different parts of the brain were activated. 
you can see quite clearly that in fact the part of the brain that was activated most was the occipital cortex, the back part of the brain. Now, this is rather intriguing when you think about it. Well, the, the input is visual, so much of the information is going to the back part of the brain for initial processing. And then, of course, presumably it should move forward, backwards, up, down, and around different parts of the brain. But this doesn't seem to be happening here. With the psychopath, the task is being performed primarily in the posterior parts of the brain. Now, we know from other studies involving uh, brain imaging studies that, in fact, it is possible to make a decision about whether or not what you see is a word in the posterior part of the brain. It's not necessary that other parts of the brain become highly active, but it's pretty hard for a normal individual to see a word like cancer or rape or death without actually drawing all sorts of other associations, cognitive affective associations. Uh, you may have an image, uh, conscious or subconscious, of what's going on. You may think of somebody, oh, do I have cancer? All these different things. And this would activate other parts of the brain. For the psychopath, that seems to be, uh, not, uh, seems not to be the case. It's as if the task is very straightforward. Is it a word or not? Who cares what, what it says? I'm going to process it in the same way in a very superficial manner.